Ask the question, why? Why is three multiplied by seven equal to 21? Why does the earth revolve around the sun? Why anything at all? From a very young age, we are inadvertently taught that the question why is at the center of everything. And rightly so. The question why is the perfect question for understanding everything. Why am I here? Because of my parents. Why are they here? Because of their parents and great-grandparents. Because the earth was fertile, because of the sun, because of the galaxy, because of the Big Bang. I might have skimmed over a few milestones of world history in there, but you get the general idea. To understand what is happening here, asking the question why helps us establish what we refer to as causes and effects. Causes and effects are crucial elements of the question why. Because when you see an effect, you ask the question why to establish its cause. Because a cause always results in an effect. And an effect is always the result of a cause. Or is it? As a researcher interested in studying causes and effects, I ask the question why viciously. I carry out studies in causality, which is a field specifically dedicated to ensuring that for every effect, there is a cause. Causality is interested in watching closely at how events not only unfold, but how they relate to one another. Causality involves running controlled experiments over and over again, adjusting variables each time to determine what comes after what. And when we know what comes after what, we can make informed statements about not only what has happened, but what can happen. Our understandings of causes and effects help us see into the future by piecing together what it can look like if certain events were to come to pass. For instance, if not paying attention causes you to burn toast in the kitchen, then you can use that understanding to make sure you're paying attention the next time you're cooking toast. But more interestingly, if you know that using your phone causes you to not pay attention, then you can already visualize in your head that using your phone in the kitchen is going to cause you to burn toast without those events ever happening. Causes and effects bring meaning to events, order and understanding to our world. Causes and effects provide us with certainty, and it feels good to be certain. With incredible versatility, the field of causality has so far answered the question why in processes ranging from business-related consultancies to clinical diagnoses. Causality is great. But while causality has been of great benefit to the vast majority of fields out there, it seems that it hasn't yet quite solved quantum mechanics. And this is because quantum particles do not subscribe to the same rules that govern all other things in the universe. At the quantum level, what is probable and improbable fundamentally changes. And we see this in the locality of quantum objects. What is the locality of an object? The locality of an object is its immediate surroundings. All physicists know that the direct causes and effects of an object's behavior are only ever established in its immediate surroundings. For instance, if I kick a ball, then it goes flying. My foot is in the immediate surroundings of the ball when I make that kick. In other words, my foot is in the ball's locality. But what if the ball went flying by itself? Well, this would be an instance of non-locality. When a phenomenon is non-local, it is not caused by anything in its immediate surroundings. For all we know, it is not caused by anything at all. It is an effect without a cause, a situation where the question why does not have an answer. Unlike a flying ball, scientists have most often studied non-locality in controlled experiments involving tiny particles. Using sophisticated machinery, they've been able to observe the particle behaviors under a variety of circumstances. In the simplest case, non-locality requires as little as two particles. Next, the particles would need to be entangled. One way to achieve entanglement is by shooting the particles through tiny crystals. 
while another way involves bombarding them with a whole lot of energy. But unlike the entanglement that affects shoelaces, quantum entanglement does not involve the jumbling of anything that can be seen or touched. Rather, it is when the particles are linked together in a way that is one of a kind. Suppose I took the first particle and I put it on one side of the room. And then I took the second particle and I put it on the other side of the room. Now these particles, they have a tendency to spin. And what I notice is that when the first particle spins upwards, so does the second. But these particles are non-local with respect to each other. In other words, their distance means that the first particle's behavior should not be causing the second. So what is causing it? I'm left scratching my head and asking the question, why? At this stage, it would be wise to start interrogating the problem through the lens of causality. And this is what scientists did. They carried out the experiment again and again to remove all doubt that the phenomenon that they were observing was a one-off. After so many times, a consensus was reached in the scientific community. And it, was, it came to be accepted that the particle spins of these two particles were undeniably correlated and nothing more. But some physicists were not convinced. What if a very small draft of wind or a small electrical charge enable these particles to still influence each other? So the particles were put into different rooms. Well, this was attempted, and what was found was that the particle spins were still correlated and nothing more. Well, then what say the distance between the two particles was increased further? How about the first particle was put in a building on one side of the city, and then a few hundred meters away, in a separate building, the second particle was put. Well, again, this was attempted, and the particle spins were still correlated. In fact, in the most scrupulous version of the experiment, the particles were spaced over a kilometer apart. And this is particularly significant. Remember the logical possibility that the first particle should be causing the behavior of the second. As causality says, causes happen before effects. For measure, it only takes a fraction of a second to observe said effect, which in this case is the particle spin of the second particle. So then the responsible influence would have to emerge from the first particle and reach the second particle before a fraction of a second has elapsed. However, if the particles are spaced over a kilometer apart, then the time it would take for that signal to travel and reach the second particle would not be able to do so in time before a fraction of a second has elapsed. In fact, light itself, the fastest signal in the universe, would not be able to make that distance in time. And yet the particle spins were still correlated. This and many other examples of non-locality provide absolutely no explanation as to why the particle spins are correlated, or more fundamentally, what is causing what. So where does this leave us? Is there no cause for non-locality? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe we don't yet have the instruments to observe the causes. Maybe the theoretical frameworks that we've been applying are wrong. Maybe there's no cause at all. I don't have an opinion about this. What's instead interesting to ask is, what do you do when you can't ask the question why? This is a non-conventional mode of thinking. And it can be particularly enlightening. Funnily enough, you don't have to be studying quantum physics to find yourself in this predicament. So what do you do when you can't ask the question why? Well, one thing you can do is ignore the question entirely. What is three multiplied by seven? And why is it equal to 21? A first grader might be able to tell you or learn to recite that it's because three sevens add up to 21. But it's not until about the third grade that they actually learn to understand and visualize the concept of multiplication. Another thing that you can do when you can't ask the question why is become imaginative. So why does the Earth revolve around the sun? Before we knew the answers, human beings came up with all sorts of explanations, some informed and some not to justify why this is so. Well, you see this little man on a bicycle in the sky and he's tied the Earth to a string and <laughs> human creativity can be delightfully interesting and entirely wrong at the same time. The third option you have 
is perhaps the most meaningful of all three. Why anything at all? Some of you may have asked this question before, perhaps in a moment of desperation or in a manner that felt spiritual. People ask this question every day when looking for the meaning of life, when trying to figure out how it all came to be or what our purposes really are. And just like in quantum mechanics, every day they're greeted with the same realization that sometimes we simply do not know the cause for everything. But just because we've been taught that the question why is at the center of everything, it doesn't mean that it is. Quantum physicists have still been able to write entire theories about measuring and modeling non-locality without ever having known how it is caused. Likewise, when we stop asking the question why, we make room for other questions, questions that, funnily enough, when overlooked, instead can remove the necessity to have to ask why in the first place. How beautiful is that sunrise? What is for breakfast? Where are we going today? These questions matter too. And what they reveal is that we can still understand, experience, and find meaning in life even when we don't know why. Thank you.